you for that, Aaron, and thank you too for all of those that shared and just what our Christianity is really about. This morning we began looking at a series on Jonah. Jonah was a fool and stubborn as a mule, as the old song said. Uh, we saw that the writer, we believed, was Jonah, used the Hebrew word great or mighty a number of times throughout the book. He's talking about great and mighty things, a great fish, a great storm, a great city, a great fear. And there's some, I was going to say magnificent, but mega big things that happen all the way through this little book. Um, God prepared Jonah. He knew the wickedness was there and he knew how easy it would be for Jonah to be discouraged. So he says, it's going to be a hard job. It's a great city. Be prepared Jonah and the people that would first read this would have been incredibly um, surprised it starts off he's a man of God the word of God comes to him and he was a successful prophet and he does a runner and this morning we just uh, considered we do runners there's things that we try and do our own way that we don't follow God and sometimes we think we know better and we don't want to do it God's way and we're not very much different at all. Let's start again from verse 1, Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to, like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? And what is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your, your blessings upon the reading of your word. We pray that your truth be glorified. Lord, this is our opportunity to, to draw closer to you, for you speak through your word. Lord, we've put various requests before you already this evening. We would lift those up again. Perhaps our minds rush to other requests and other <laughs> thoughts. You know all our thoughts, but we thank you even those we have trouble uh, putting into words, you know where our hearts are. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity now and we gather around with anticipation, knowing that you love to speak to your people. And we pray all this in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I wonder what Jonah looked like when he came down from, um, wherever he came down from, up in the hills, and he came down to to drop it aboard the boat. I wonder whether the sailors look at here. There's that guilty look of man. I wonder what he's flying, getting away from. Is he a criminal? What's he been up to? Because I'm sure that Jonah would have had a guilty conscience and it probably was all over his face. In verse 3, it tells us that he pays his fare. He gets on the boat. And then in verse 4, we're reminded it is impossible for anyone to flee to escape the presence of of the Lord. Remember that Jonah was trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. Have a look in verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, 
And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Folks, is there any doubt who is in control of this story? Is there any doubt at all that God is in control, that God is Lord of all? He sends a great wind. There's that word gadol again, a great wind. The God of all creation is able. He's very capable of just brewing up a storm and and sending it down as he would wish, even in the blink of an eye. But we also see, if we go to the Gospels, that Christ is also capable of calming those storms in the same amount of time. This was no ordinary squall. Verse 4 tells us the ship is about to be broken apart. And I can imagine that the the timbers on that ship were doing more than just creaking. I'd say they're nearly probably squealing as they're being stretched and almost pulled out of, of, uh, pulled apart. This was no ordinary storm. There's some subtle lessons here. We've touched on it already this morning. When we run from God, we might find ourselves in a storm. Or maybe not a literal storm with wind and rain, but a storm in our mind and a storm of, of unpeace all around us. Unpeace is perhaps not a word, but a storm all around us and, and being disheartened and miserable. And the interesting thing is when we're miserable, we can bring miserableness upon others. It can affect us. Even when we say, well, look, we're going to be stubborn and obstinate to God, it can affect others. Just have a look at the first part of verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship of the sea to lighten it of them. Here's seasoned mariners, they're sailors, they're old salties and they're afraid. They're desperately afraid. They had good reason to be because Jonah's actions had placed them in serious danger. So each of these sailors is in a great fear and they cry out to their own gods, which is vastly more than Jonah is doing. I've said this book is a book of surprises. Look again in verse 5. We've seen their fear in the beginning of verse 5. Then halfway through we read, But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So you've got these sailors, experienced men, they're afraid for their lives. And Jonah is asleep in the hole. That's unusual. That normally wouldn't happen. And there's another shocking twist in the story. How can he go down to sleep in such on such an occasion? It's almost, we could say, it's almost disgusting. It's like, Jonah, what are you doing down there? It's disgusting. You're supposed to be a man of God. And you're down there in a bit of a a stupor. Though this is an actual account, there's literary genius all through this book. Literary genius in the sense of the words of use of, like I said, uh, great or mighty and... uh, here there's a sense of he goes from the hills down to Joppa, down to the coast. Then he goes down into the ship's hold and now he's in a deep sleep. Down, down, down. And the lesson begins to come through. If you're running away from God, it's going to be down. You're going to go down, down, down and you may not realize it because it'll be like you'll be in a stupor you'll be half asleep to what's happening you'll think you'll be in control but you'll be thinking you'll be wondering why are these things happening you won't be aware as Jonah was not aware he was in the boat and he was sound asleep it's no coincidence that as we look at the the life of Jonah and how Jonah reacted and and all the sailors were leading and so forth, that there was another man in the scriptures, another Hebrew, and he was travelling westward into the Mediterranean. Acts 27, the Apostle Paul, but he stood up and he he was a leader. He filled the vacuum and he would talk about his God and there was no hesitation in talking about his God and that God was in control of the storm. 
And with Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was able to encourage the people. But Jonah, as a man of God, he was asleep. He was out of it. He was not knowing what was happening around him. And, and uh, people were running around on the boat and he was out of it. He was slipping into a sleep as the crew was slipping deeper and deeper into great danger. That's what running away from God could do to us. It takes us from the life that we could be leading and it takes us from the safety, the security, the sure-footedness of walking with God. Jonah's about to be awakened. Have a look in verse 6. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. If we're amazed that Joan is down there asleep, I wonder what this salt-soaked, you know, seawater-soaked sailor, the captain, is thinking, how could this man, when the ship's being tossed this way and that way and there's water coming, how can he be asleep? They've ditched the cargo and still Jonah is sleeping. I'm sure when he said, oh, sleeper, I bet you didn't say it like that. I bet you had some other, oh, sleeper, I don't know, dundercumbin, I don't know what he would have said. Whatever it was, this idea of sleeper was not complimentary. Does Jonah pray? We're not told. Does he panic? We don't know. But he goes and joins the other sailors. They, all the other sailors, know their only hope is from an outside source. This storm is so incredible, it's so big that a divine source is their only hope. But they feel that that something is blocking it and they believe it would be one of their own. So they have a way to find out. Have a look at verse 7. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Oh, Jonah. I mean, he probably doesn't like the idea of these pagans casting lots to find out that he's guilty. These worshipper of false gods. But how can he protest? He's the sleeper. He's the runaway. He's the rebel to the one true God. Proverbs 16.33 The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And that's just simply saying there's a lot of chance happening around the world, but God has control of all things. We don't always understand how it happens, but don't think anything is out of God's control. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. You would have thought that once the lot fell on Jonah, that these old salties, these rough sailors with their crude jokes and so forth, would just grab Jonah and throw him overboard. But there's more to these men than we realise. We'll see a lot of restraint, we see sensitivity. Have a look in verse 8. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? Now, for the first time, we're going to hear Jonah speak. And folks, the first thing he is going to say is his nationality. We'll look at that later on as the story progresses. Have a look at verse 9. And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God, the creator God, that's made the sea and the dry land. I fear the creator God, the creator of all of this. No wonder these men had a great fear. Have a look in verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and it's that word again, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So this, why have you done this, is not really a question. It's more of an exclamation. Why are you fleeing from the presence of the Lord? How, how could you do that? How could you be a prophet of God? How could you do that? And, and they're exceedingly 
afraid. The truth has hit their hearts that this storm is because of this man. This man has upset God Almighty. And God Almighty isn't forgetting him. He's just bringing a storm and maybe just killing them all. They have realisation God's working here and it's because of this man he's done something. He's fled from the presence of the Lord. And they fear God. They fear God. And I'm sure Joan is about to fear God as well. Have a look in verse 11. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be, may, may be calm unto us? For the sea roared and was tempestuous. So Jonah has confessed. I did read verse 10, didn't I? Then they were exceedingly afraid. That's right, I have. So what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm? For the sea wrought, that's got the idea of the sea is increasing and was tempestuous. So Jonah confesses it. They know that he's the trouble. Surely the storm might settle down now that he's come clean, that he's confessed what's going on. But no, the storm's going to get worse and worse. Jonah answers their question in verse 12. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. For my sake this great tempest is upon you. Did Jonah really want them just to throw him overboard to drown? I mean, does he want to be thrown overboard to drown? Could have jumped. <laughs> he could have, I suppose. I guess really Jonah's only got two options at the moment on the, with all the circumstances. He could be thrown overboard and drown or he could stay on board the boat. The boat would be ripped apart and they'd all drown. So his two options are I could drown alone or I could be thrown in and... or oh, sorry, drown alone or drown with all my friends. So he does the right thing, of course, and he says, uh, throw me overboard. But you know... Here he is, this Hebrew, this man of God, and these people that aren't Hebrews are showing restraint. They're showing concern. Because we see in verse 13, they're still going to consider him. Look in verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew more tempestuous against him. So the harder they tried, the worse the storm got. They're trapped with a raging storm all around them. It's splashing over the decks. The ship's timbers are groaning. They're ready to snap. The sailors have no other choice. Let's read verse 14. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. This is an amazing verse. O oh Lord, it's the word Jehovah. It's a covenant name for God. They're calling out to, Jeho to Jonah's God, Jehovah, to save them. We don't see Jonah calling out to God. These pagan men who are humble, they realise that this is the one true God. These worshippers of false gods are now calling out to the one true God. They're confessing that God can do as he pleases and they're humbling himself before him. I mean, what would Jonah think? What are these men doing? They don't even believe in this God. This is my God. This is the God of the Jews. And yet they're using the name of Jehovah. What would Jonah have thought? We don't know. Let's look at verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. It's done. The sea's gone calm. The storm has disappeared. The rage and the fury has, has just gone away. The storm's melted. Everything's just gone calm. And they'd been given the opportunity, the sailors, to see the Lord's God at work. And, and now they respond the best way that they know how. Have a look in verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. 
and offered a sacrifice under the Lord and made vows. There's that amazing Hebrew word for great or mighty. They feared the Lord exceedingly. They greatly. What a contrast. The proud Hebrew and self-proclaimed God-fearer does a runner from God's authority, from his might. He thinks, well, I'll just do what I want to do. And these pagan men, great fear upon them. They're giving sacrifice to God and acknowledging God for all that he is. They're sensitive to the one true God. They're sensitive that he's got all power and all authority. They're sensitive to that and say he can do what he likes and we'll give him homage. What an amazing occurrence. This book of Jonah is amazing. We need to sit back and and say, wow, let's think about some of these things. And I just want to give a, a couple of simple lessons and then I'll come to a close. God loves his children and will pursue them and intervene in their life. You're maybe a Christian here and in some way you've been a runner. God's not going to give up on you. We mentioned that this morning. God doesn't say to you or you or you, bad luck, buddy. You've messed up once. You've messed up twice. That's three times. You're out. No. Those of us that are older here know that God has always been faithful to us. He's always come back. When we've come back and we've confessed our sins and come back and said we're sorry, He's always brought us back to himself. He's never given up on his own because he's an amazing, great God. We can't outrun God. We can run away this way and that way, but wherever we turn, God is always there. Francis Thompson had tried to run from God. He wrote about this in his famous poem, The Hound of Heaven. And this is how the the poem begins. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. So this man talks about fleeing from God. And he pictures God like a hound that follows him. Wherever he goes, God is following him. God is always there. It's like a hound. It's pounding after him. We can't run from God. We can't hide. Jonah should have known that. Jonah should have known that. There's another lesson. God's mercy is massive. This storm tells us that God spares no expense in chasing after his own when they wander or when they go astray. I mean, God could have easily raised up someone else to do that job, to go down to Nineveh. God could have raised up 50 men to come in from different angles and strategically get into Nineveh and give the message out. But God spares no expense because he just wanted Jonah to do it. And God can raise up a storm. God could raise up a fish. God can do whatever he likes. He is totally powerful. And God's mercy, his great power, he will do that in people's lives. Maybe we're afraid of of that. He will move circumstances. I know I've shared it here before, but I'll mention it again. I can remember as a policeman, I'd often seen a lot of people... um, failures, especially alcoholics and one particular day I was in a country station and went to this particular house and through the window had been thrown a bottle that was filled with I presume petrol, I can't remember and it had a, a rag in the top of it and when they'd thrown the rag I think the fire had gone out and, and just smashed the window and uh, I turned up there, I think I was working by myself and there was a man that was drunk on the floor And I spent some time, sort of tried to get some sense out of him, but he was too drunk. He would have been far too drunk to get up and and to leave. I got his details, and often when you write their name down as well as hearing it, you remember it fairly well. And that was, I thought, would be the last that I saw of him. And then 
probably four or five months later, I saw him in church. And he was asked to stand up and he gave a testimony and he stood up, <laughs> shared about his battle with the grog and what God had done. I happened to be there that night to hear that. I didn't happen to be there that night. I needed a shake up. I hardly believed that God could heal an alcoholic because I'd seen so many alcoholics that had stuck in their ways, that are always living in defeat. And afterwards I grabbed him, figuratively. You know, is your name so and so? You know, are you and do you remember that? Yes, he was a man. Why is it that we we don't believe God can do mighty things? Why is it that we don't know that God can go to the nth degree to save someone, to save a soul? Why why do we cringe back and just live in our comfortable little sphere and think, well, God is out there yeah we'll go to church but we're like a little circle we've got this little buffer zone or a force field and we're safe and God's not going to make us uncomfortable in any way but God does God's mercy is massive he will save people if we will but pray for them if we will but have a heart to go out God will do it on his timing I know that I, I cannot do but but otherwise I mentioned this morning I was asked I and I went out on Friday to speak to a man regarding his salvation. And I believe God had gone before. God answers prayer. God is a magnificent God. The supreme example of this massive mercy of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. That he would send a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and die for us. To die on the cross, to be identified with us our Lord Jesus once was walking out with his disciples and, he, and they all stopped and they looked up into the sycamore tree and there's little Zacchaeus hiding up there behind the bushes just trying to have a look do you remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said he said a few words and then he said for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost that God would send his own son to become a human like us and identify with us shows us the very heart of God. That God is even now striving with the people that you know, the people that you're praying for. And if you will but continue to pray, and if you'll only continue to talk as you have the opportunity, God will delight to bless. And all the power of God is behind that. All the omniscience of God is behind that because God knows. God knows what's going to happen. And he's just waiting. Ephesians tells us that he's got good works prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. For you to talk to someone on the train. For you to talk to someone at, at work and, and maybe they'll come and ask you. It's the greatness of God. God has a, a massive mercy and a massive love and, and here in the story of Jonah he spares no expense to wake Jonah up to send a storm you know in our economy a great storm like that would cost a lot of money no expense was spared for this single man of all the world's religions only we have a God that would become one of us and identify with us and it's a mystery how the Lord Jesus Christ would be fully man, fully able to identify with us. He becomes our high priest. He's fully man and yet he's fully God. He's pure. He's holy. He's a perfect man for us. And then the Heavenly Father would have him die in our place. For the wages of sin is death. But our representative man would die for us what a wonderful saviour that we have our Lord Jesus is the storm God sent the Lord Jesus our Lord Jesus is the storm now he may not come with great fury he might come with a quiet word our Lord Jesus is also God's 
intervention for those that are enslaved. And the Lord Jesus comes and in him the captives are set free. Sometimes we need a trial, something to wake us up. I asked the question this morning, are you going through some trial? Is there some way that God is desiring to wake you up or maybe to get your thoughts realigned and thinking the right way? Like Jonah, there may be a lesson in it for you. Or maybe like Job, you're completely innocent, but God is still doing things around you you don't understand. And God is able to do that like Job. We don't always understand why God does things, but it does stop and get us to put our focus back completely upon God. That our Lord Jesus would intervene as he's done here with Jonah in our lives is a wonderful It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I know that Christ can be trusted because he died for us. He became our substitute to take the wrath of God, to take the punishment that we deserve while we were yet unlovely. He did it because we were unlovely, but by doing that, he makes us lovely. And we could ask the question, how are we responding to Christ? Are we thrilled that he would die for us? Are we thrilled that he can walk with us as our Lord and Saviour? Most here, I would say, have put their trust in him for salvation. But have you put your trust in him for tomorrow? And all that tomorrow brings. I wondered how I should close the service, but I think I'll just close simply with one of my favourite verses but I hope and pray that the truth of this will just put you in awe that that, that Jesus who could send a storm that Jesus who could be the storm would care so much for us and this is from the perspective of of the Father he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him Freely give us all things. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how should not with him freely give us all things? If we've already got the Lord Jesus Christ, will not the Father, I said it the wrong way around, will the Father hesitate to give us good things? Of course not. That's how good our God is. If we have the Son. That was Romans 8.32. Let me close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great power in the book of Jonah, the great storm, the great fear, the great city, the great fish. Lord, I thank you that you are such a great God. And Lord, our Forgive us that we put you in such a small little box. Have mercy on us, we pray. We pray we might be set free, that we might become excited about the things of you. And uh, Lord, be those witnesses, those lights on the hill that we should be. We thank you, we praise you. Lord, we pray too for this church, for South West. We pray that you might grow her in every sense, that this church too might shine and glow for you, that we might be about your business understanding that uh, the church is your body and we're privileged to be that. We thank you and praise you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.